Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. My name is Kimberly Cook, and I'm the Senior Administrator here at the Hendrick Center. And today, we're going to be talking about anxiety. <laughs> so we're not worried about this podcast at all. Um, we're joined by Dr. Kelly Cheatham, who is the Director of Counseling Services and an Adjunct Professor of Biblical Counseling here at DTS, and Jenny Wong, who is a Senior Therapist at Lifeology Institute Frisco and a DTS grad, and one of Jenny's specialties just happens to be helping people with anxiety. So we're happy to have you here as well. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be here. So we're just going to jump right into the conversation Mm -hmm. today. And um, anxiety, I think (laughs) we all know sort of what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think it was a respectable thing that I looked that up on, though I did not know what it was. Approximately 18% of the U.S. population each year is dealing with anxiety, is mm-hmm. what I found at least online. So okay. something is saying that, uh-huh. uh, which is a lot. It's a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. And so I'm assuming that you all see many cases of anxiety in your practices mm-hmm. and in your offices. So first off, let's just talk about what it is. What is anxiety? Uh, what is what's normal? You know, a normal way f- mm-hmm. that people, you know, just how God made us. Where I have to imagine that there's some kind of automatic response that happens, and it's totally mm-hmm. fine. Right. And then it becomes a clinical issue if it gets past a certain point. So, Jenny, why don't you start us off? How should what do we what are we talking about when we're talking about anxiety? Well, absolutely, anxiety is normal. Like right now, I feel a little anxious. <laughs> <laughs> um, and normal anxiety tends to be. Um, you know, specific to a situation. And it also is periodic. Um, and for example, right now, you know, being anxious about being on this podcast is my first one. I, you know, my my stomach's um, fluttering a little bit. Um, I might be talking a little bit fast. There's physical symptoms to it. It's just this feeling of apprehension. That's normal anxiety. Um, when, it, when we're talking about an anxiety disorder, we tend to be talking specifically about um, a few things that it tends to be more chronic. When we follow the GSM-5, which is kind of our handbook of mental disorders, um, it's you know six months or more. Um, it is persistent, um, and there's um, there is a um, intensity to it, um, and there's a lot of physiological symptoms. Um, as well, um, such as, um, you know, actually mind fog is a huge one. So a lot of people um, might come into counseling and they say, you know, I can't think clearly, Um, you know, I can't do my job clearly, I don't know what's going on. And one thing I will say, you know, is, well, it sounds like you might have anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, There is tiredness that goes along with with it. Um, So there's some very, you know, um, consistent physical symptoms that go along with anxiety as well. Mm-hmm. Kelly, would you have anything to add? Um, I would just agree with everything she, she shared there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it is important to recognize that there. I think of it as normal anxiety and problem anxiety, just as far as terminology. Mm-hmm. And so anxious, anxiety is normal. It's part of our condition. In fact, we need to have some anxiousness at mm-hmm. times. Keeps us safe. Keeps us. We need to have a little bit of fear about certain things. Keeps us from walking in traffic and <laughs> and uh, touching a hot stove. Those kinds of things. Right. Um, but it becomes problematic when it is. Uh, it, our anxiety should kind of rise and fall, but when it stays okay. high mm-hmm. at this heightened level, mm-hmm. then we do experience those those symptoms that should again diminish. But if they if our state our anxiety states stays too high for whatever reason, um, and we are experiencing more of a disorder then it's very uncomfortable and it really is kind of hyper uh, active Mm -hmm. in a way. And so that's when it's more problematic and we see all kinds of symptoms from that. It's not, it has a long-term prolonged uh, effect on our health and um, so it's a real pervasive physiological, mental, emotional, relational Mm -hmm. impact. So that heightened sense, you know, I don't know how, tension or, or, you know, as you're talking about it, seems to be more pervasive or at least is named more maybe that's more of an accurate Mm -hmm. um assessment who knows uh it seems to be more uh called out at least in our society particularly amongst millennials and gen z especially it seems like gen z american psychological association has 
giant pages about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a variety of other studies have been done, particularly as related to social media, but Mm -hmm. just overall about that generation. So is that something that you all have seen in your practice? And if so, what do you, why do you think maybe millennials and Gen Z specifically are struggling so much with that? Dr. Chino, let's talk. It's a great question. Um, I'm not sure, actually, but I think there is something to the, I'd love to hear what Jenny has to say. Uh, (laughs) There's something to this idea, this theory really about Uh, maybe about social development, social skill development of of younger generations, and maybe because of the internet, maybe social media, those kinds of things, people just literally aren't doing things face-to-face like we used to, Mm -hmm. and um, they're more prone to maybe maybe isolate themselves and just haven't, because anxiety is about, the the way that we we learn to deal with that, those anxious feelings is to face our anxieties, but if Mm -hmm. we aren't in the situations to where we can face them, we never really learn how to manage it. And so when something comes along, or we haven't actually experienced something, but we think about what it would be like to experience it um, but we haven't really tested ourselves to sh- show that it's not maybe not as anxiety provoking as it needs to be or that we can actually withstand the anxiety the, the thing that we're facing the threat or the challenge um, then we are going to be uh, more prone to maybe have things like social anxiety social anxiety is uh, I have found that to be a pretty prevalent mm. among my uh, mm. clientele but I see adults too I mean I mean older adults not yeah. just the, the Millennials um, it seems to be more of a gender uh, difference. I think women are more prone to have anxiety disorders mm-hmm. than men. Um, but I guess there is maybe something to the, the generational mm-hmm. aspect of it. Jenny, you largely you work a lot with younger ad- adolescents and younger people. Correct? I do. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. what are your thoughts on this? So, I absolutely have seen. Um, an increase throughout these years that I practice. I actually started practicing. I graduated from Dallas Seminary in 2007, um, and I have seen a change within these 12 years. I'm trying to do math. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I get um, it. <laughs> you know, within these 12 years, um, an increase, and that is actually something that I noticed probably four or five years ago that I would say to my colleagues, there is an increase in teenagers coming in for anxiety. Um, so that is definitely something I've seen personally. Um, I, I also don't know um, the reason why, but I do have some theories, um, personal theories. I haven't actually done research on it. Um, some of my thoughts are, um, so I completely agree with Dr. Cheatham that one of the hallmarks of anxiety is avoidance, Mm -hmm. um, is wanting to avoid something. Um, So I think there's two main things. I think the rise of um, the internet and how much knowledge there is um, online that there's so much more to be afraid of. You know, Mm -hmm. I think part of just living in this world and living in this in between stage between when Jesus is, you know, between, you know, the Garden of Eden and when Jesus will come back again is there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, but now we have all this knowledge mm-hmm. that is so accessible. Um, and these young people who don't know how to deal with that or cope with that. So I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is um, that um, maybe my generation. Um, we didn't really know how to deal with our stress. Mm-hmm. And so we're not teaching that to our children. Um, and I think that more and more adults are stressed out. And we're bringing that into our families. And But we're not teaching our children how to deal with that stress and that anxiety. Mm-hmm. So going off of what mm-hmm. you were just talking about with regard to having access to more information, mm-hmm. I, I just think about myself when I was, I guess I was, this reveals my age, but I was... 15, 14 or 15 when September 11th happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I was a freshman in high school. And I just very specifically remember, mm-hmm. obviously, that happening, right. but also everything and just all of the 24 hour media coverage and all mm-hmm. of that. And, you know, and the the growing awareness of Islam and, you know, the relationship and dynamics there between that religion and the West and, and all of that. I remember seeing all of that and, and I felt myself, you know, I mean, I think everybody was, but, mm-hmm. but that's actually what my question is, 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 is there something to you? I mean, you talked about our generation, maybe even those a little bit older than mm-hmm. us. I think maybe as everybody has gotten access to more of what's going on, mm-hmm. everybody feels right. that way. Yeah, right. You know, it's different because you, there are some of us, and even myself, who can remember when you didn't have access to that kind of information. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you had the news, <coughs> you know, at 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock, you know, that kind of thing, right. but you definitely didn't have the constant internet stream. So that's a little bit different for these younger generations. Yeah. But is part of it that none of us really know how to deal with that? 
I don't know. What do you think? That amount of information? Yeah. Yeah. There's something to that. One thing I say to my clients is don't go home and Google, start Googling things because we can, I think we have a tendency to overdiagnose ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you, your abnormal class is probably this way, abnormal behavior course where um, every week we study a different disorder and we, and we end up finding out that we all kind of diagnose ourselves. Oh, I think I'm, I have this. I think I have that. Mm -hmm. And so I think people do that. I think we have, there is so much information out there we can actually, people can kind of read things into mm -hmm. themselves and find that. So sometimes the, back, the information overload or the amount of information can actually maybe backfire and there's a point there's a time when people just didn't have those things and maybe there there's a good there's a there's a trade-off to that there's some things about that that are good and things about that that are not so good mm -hmm. but i think we can be more prone to maybe take the information we have and kind of turn it against ourselves in a way that's mm -hmm. not rational mm -hmm. so um so anxiety is often about irrational fear mm -hmm. so it's it's about how do we you know with the information we have what are we doing with it and the more information we have the more the more i guess the more possibilities there are for us to turn that into a rational uh, interpretation. What is the difference between anxiety and worry? Is there a difference? I think of worry as a type of anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's something that, um, and again, the, wor the word anxiety is such a big word. You know, mm -hmm. it means so many things to so many people. Um, so fear, worry, anxiety, mm -hmm. stress, those are all kind of mingled together. Mm -hmm. But worry is really about, you know, overly um, thinking about things that we have no control of, things mm -hmm. that are in the future, even things that are going on now, mm -hmm. and, and trying to, for some reason, overthink it. I think it's a way for us to kind of feel like if we think about it enough, we'll be able to control it, mm -hmm. we'll be prepared for it. But again, there's a certain amount of, I guess, worry, for lack of a better word, that's okay as far as pre preparing ourselves and, pre being, uh, and kind of getting, again, prepared for mm -hmm. something that may happen, but there's also a point to where it's it's point of diminishing return now it's actually hurting us mm -hmm. jenny what yeah. would you say is the relationship between anxiety and burnout or how does burnout play into this conversation because to me it seems like if somebody is overtired mm -hmm. or overextended then they may be presenting symptoms of anxiety or something like that but that might not actually be what's going on or is that what's going on just what's the relationship between the two i think they're very tied together so um you know all those words worry fear i think have more to do with um our thoughts right what's going on in our head i think anxiety burnout the rate the, how they're correlated is that it's more of an all-encompassing thing it's when that worry and fear has become physiological mm -hmm. and has become something that is um causing dysfunction in mm -hmm. our life yeah. So I think they're definitely correlated with each other. There's a strong correlation between uh, between the mental and physical aspects yeah. of anxiety. Uh -huh. If you look at an anxiety assessment, for example, a lot of the questions have to do with physical symptoms, and which Jenny mentioned earlier. Right. So there's very much of a correlation there. So it does manifest itself physically. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people don't re make that connection. That, that they realize that they're happy. For example, people off will often go to an ER thinking they're having a heart attack, and it's an anxiety attack, mm -hmm. and they have no idea. And right. it can be out of the blue. They're not necessarily in a stressful situation. That's mm -hmm. why they're confused. Right. Um, but they do probably have a low state of, at least a lower state of anxiety mm -hmm. that they've just kind of aren't really that aware of, but it's contributing to maybe a panic yeah. uh, episode. That, oh. So there's this connection there and burnout. Yeah, I, I agree that there's certainly a connection between the, uh, we think of burnout as being more a physiological mm -hmm. um, uh, manifestation and a, just a fatigue and, and all those kinds of things that may, people, again, may or may not be associating with their stress and their anxiety. So right. there's all kinds of preventative things that we can do to avoid burnout. Mm -hmm. And one thing is to, to have good boundaries and probably yeah. get, gonna get to that here in a minute, mm -hmm. I guess. But, yeah. Okay. So, so, sorry, my thing is messing up. Okay. So these are all very clinical answers and that's mm -hmm. lovely and that's what I've been asking for. How do we as Christians think differently mm -hmm. about anxiety? Is there a way? Is it just, you know, it's a human condition and it's something that we just kind of have to navigate? Obviously, we've all been educated here at DTS, so I don't think that that's fully going to be our answer. But how is there a way that we need to think differently about it? Um, I, to me, when I consider when I'm anxious and, um, you know, worried about something, I always think about the verse that, you know, 
my yoke is easy and my burden is light, mm-hmm. being anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, you know, and, and I right. think about that. And then I think, oh, no, well, now I feel guilty because mm-hmm. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> because I'm, I am being anxious. And so now I'm, mm-hmm. you know, either anxious about being anxious or, you know, I'm <laughs> guilty about being anxious and that doesn't help anything. Yeah, right? Right. And so how do you all help people negotiate anxiety and being a believer mm-hmm. and the commands that we do see in scripture and is it is it sin to be anxious if it is a natural thing just jenny open us up <laughs> what <laughs> <Dr. Cheetah. laughs> um you know i definitely think that the reason why you know the words do not fear or fear not um are, is in the bible is because it is a human condition like i had mentioned before just in this living in this world i mean it's anxiety provoking um and the verse that i think of actually it well it's many i mean it's a whole passage is in uh, luke 12 where you know jesus talks about you know um you know look how he clothes the um you know the lilies mm-hmm. of the valley and the birds of the field but the one verse that really stands out to me is actually luke 12 uh, 32 i had to look at my paper um where he says do not be afraid little flock and those words, little flock, um, help to remind me, helps me to remind my clients that God cares for us deeply. He sees our condition. He knows where we're at. He knows that we will be afraid. You know, I think about when, um, you know, Mary was, the first thing that the angel told Mary is, do not be afraid. Like, um, and just, you know, I, I know that I've heard passages or I've heard um, sermons where they said, you know, that that's this imperative that God gives. He doesn't want us to be afraid and um, and we just need to. But I, I feel like God says it so often because he knows we're going to be afraid. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so he just is reminding us. So, you know, is it a sin, fear? I mean, like any emotion, I don't believe that it's a, any emotion mm-hmm. that's a sin. It's how we respond to that emotion mm-hmm. um, if, we, if we go to God in that emotion or if we, you know, um, you know, start to, um, I don't know, just kind of go within ourselves, or you know, hurt hurt ourselves, <laughs> or hurt other people. Um, those yeah. try to resolve it in our own strength. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dr. Cheatham, what would you add? Um, I very much agree. I think it's. I don't think of it so much as a sin. I think it's more of an indication, or more of a symptom of our condition. It's not. It's not a volitional sin. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is destructive as sin is. But I think I agree. I think that Jesus's words too, Matthew six in particular, is, you know, it's it's more coming from um, encouragement mm-hmm. rather than um, condemnation or or something like that. Yeah. It's he knows we're going to struggle with it. Um, so I think that it's really just looking at it as as something that he it's coming as far as scripture goes, um, as far as the gospels go of, of recognizing we're going to struggle with this. It's part of our condition. Mm-hmm. Um, but to really turn to, to the Lord and not try, I think it can become more of a, actually become more sinful, if you will, when we, um, we experience the condition and we're experiencing things that are causing maybe stress and anxiety. And yet we continue to refuse to go to the Lord with it and just try to do it on our own, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's when it that's when it really becomes so I think when I even think maybe when um when they're this talk, this talked about in scripture, we're talking about more of this chronic anxiety and not just a feeling of anxiety here and there, but something that's really debilitating, maybe more like an anxiety disorder. This is before the DSM. Uh, <laughs> but um but us really again, not you know, choosing to try to do it on our own and be our own God and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. and that's when it's I think probably we'd say that's more of a sin now we're actually not choosing to trust or obey god's call to to go to him mm-hmm. with these things and and you know in matthew 6 jesus is talking about how um you know about how you know look look what god has it's more about his his providence for us and right. taking care of us and 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 um, why are we worried about these things mm-hmm. um and then uh paul and and philippians 4 talks about uh again he says not to be anxious for anything Mm -hmm. and it's this same idea that Mm -hmm. you know hey go to the lord with it you know find peace in 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 him um so it's they're almost these verses i think are more again about not not so much about not having it but more about not letting it control you and, and facing it which is the way we we've found that even in a secular world, this is the way we handle anxiety: is right. to 
face it with courage and not avoid it, mm-hmm. like Jenny said mm-hmm. earlier. Yeah. It kind of gives you a new um, perspective on the kingdom too. You know, like in, in eternity when, and, and maybe and that's a diff- also another way that Christians can think differently about it is it's a new place for hope. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you yeah. don't have to right. be afraid anymore. Right. You know, and right. that, mm-hmm. I mean, I can't even <clears throat> imagine. I feel like the older I get, the tighter I get mm-hmm. in my shoulders, you know, because <laughs> because you learn so many more things that can go wrong and, mm-hmm. you know, and tragedies that happen and, and that kind of thing. It's like the older you get, the more you actually have almost to worry about. I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe not. But, but you know, that eventually one day with that tension will be gone, mm-hmm. hopefully. And I think there's something to be said for just accepting the reality of this, of this world. And, 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 you know, Jesus never promised that this world was not going to have the, the, the difficulties we have, mm-hmm. again, it's the same theme of you're going to have them, you're going to face them, what are you going to do? This is what you can do. Mm-hmm. You know, take it to God himself and lift him up to, to the Heavenly Father. And um, but yeah, and, and but there will be one day in glory we won't have these issues. Right. And um, But until then, um, this is where we are. Mm-hmm. So we accept them. This is part of the world we're in. And, but but the, the good news is there there is an answer. And uh, this is something we absolutely can address. This is not um, uh, something that we should feel doomed by. Often anxiety can turn into more of a depression. There's Mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. big overlap there. And that's when I think people do get into this, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't use these shoulds. Mm. I shouldn't be anxious. I shouldn't be afraid. I should trust God more. And so what's wrong with me? And I'm no. And then it turns inward mm-hmm. into this depressive state. So I think we have to guard against that with our clients and recognize that there's something to be said for accepting uh, challenges and difficulties and actually looking for the for the ways that we can grow, the trials and tribulations that Paul talks about in, in Romans 5, you know, yeah. about that and how we can learn from those things mm-hmm. and not let it be something that we, again, are trying to hide from or deny or avoid, but say, okay, this is where we are. And, right. but again, this is, that's not the end. So theologically, it is a, it is a symptom of the fallen world in which we live. And we're all probably going to have to deal with it. And so experiencing it isn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a sin. It's what you do with it. That's what I'm hearing you all say. That's the way I think yeah, of it. Absolutely. And, yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, as far as sin, it it is a part of the broken, mm-hmm. sinful world, right. and so we all experience it. And so, in that way, we're experiencing sin. right, right, <laughs> right, know? exactly. But it's it's all about how you respond and whether you let it control you, whether you let it, you mm-hmm. know, master you, or you you are trying to master it rather than taking it to the Lord and right. taking it to the community of faith and saying, "I need help here," mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Okay, not isolating yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So, how does Taking it a little bit, narrowing the uh, conversation a little bit, how do you all, or, and I, Dr. Cheatham, you are, like I said, Director of Counseling Services here at DTS, so you're mm-hmm. regularly working with people who are either in ministry or headed into ministry, most mm-hmm. likely. Yeah. Um, and so how do you see anxiety manifesting itself mm-hmm. specifically for those in the ministry world? It's a what good does question. What it look like? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I, I've been, in, I've seen, of course, seen people in and outside of seminary, and I, I see probably definitely more commonality than differences. Um, I think that uh, people in ministry, um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, we can be prone to um, trying to do too much and, and maybe burning out, like you mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. that's, uh, not maybe, definitely uh, burning <laughs> out with good things. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to do so many good things, and I've experienced this myself. I've tried to do good things that were too much, mm-hmm. and, and that can lead to anxiety. So it's about uh, recognizing that even though it's a good thing, we still have our limits. And so ministry, I think, is kind of a fertile ground for that, to have good things we're excited about, but to get ourselves in situations where we can um, <clears throat> maybe be more prone to anxiety mm-hmm. uh, because we aren't exercising good uh, boundaries mm-hmm. and we're, we're getting things out of order sometimes. Right. Um, and when that happens, we all kinds of things uh, can result from that. So, mm-hmm. I think that, again, more common is more commonalities and differences. But I think there are some things that are probably more specific to ministry. 
for seminarians in particular, there's the stress and anxiety of, of course, the coursework itself. Mm -hmm. And often we have students that come in to counseling services when they're getting close to the end, actually, usually the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. You know, they're adjusting to counsel, uh, to uh, seminary and moving here from all over the world, literally, all the adjustment that goes with that, right. which anxiety often is related to change and adjustment. Yeah. And then the the um, this idea of oh actually I'm going to graduate now I'm going to have to <laughs> you know, go off and, and go to you know start a church or join a church or whatever it might be or become a counselor and and the change of that um, so that's not similar from someone graduating from a other program mm -hmm. or any other kind of degree for that matter but um, but that's something I've I've seen is. Um, that people preparing for ministry, and even though they're excited about it, there's also some some fear about what this is going to mean, and how am I going to be able to provide for my family? Maybe right. there's a lot of unknown about that. So, so you mentioned getting things out of order as far as it relates to ministry. Um, would you just unpack that a little bit? Uh, this is one of those. I mean, we're, we're counselors. We're, we we love cliches, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and one of them that I often use is uh, make family your, your family your first ministry, mm -hmm. whatever that is, whatever your family is. So I I think if we get things out of order and we aren't really ministering to our family first, it, as as an example of what I was talking about there, then we're gonna we're gonna feel the consequences of that. Maybe mm -hmm. not immediately, but eventually, that we're gonna f start finding things that are not the way they need to be. So mm -hmm. God is a God of order, and and we need to proceed in that, in that way too. We need to make sure that we are doing things in order. We 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 need to make sure that we are living by our own values. You know, you, I often have clients that'll they realize after we talk that they're not really living, they want, they don't, we're not, really not sure why they feel the way they do, uh -huh. but they're, then they realize I'm not really living the way that I want to or supposed to or need uh -huh. to. Things are out of whack. How did uh -huh. I get here? And maybe trying to keep up with the Joneses or trying to you know compare ourselves to other people and those kinds of things uh -huh. and, and not really just taking things as they come. Um, so I don't know, there's something to, to be said about that, about recognizing that um, we only have certain um, a certain amount of time, resources, energy. We've got to be good stewards of those things, and we've got to keep things in the right order to be to be who God has called us to be. Mm -hmm. and it's a matter of balance, often. Yeah. <laughs> so order <of> balance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Jenny, what would you? So, so we're talking. I was talking with Kelly about. Um about addressing anxiety as it manifests itself in those in ministry. Mm -hmm. But kind of maybe turning the tables a little bit, what would you, if you were talking to pastors and ministry leaders uh, about, you know, hey, you're going to face the, this in people in your ministry. Like, so people in your ministry are going to be manifesting this. Okay. Um, so how would you suggest that, one, they identify it? Uh -huh. um, because a lot of times pastors see people way before – you know, clinicians mm -hmm. do. Right. And so how do they identify it and mm -hmm. how would um, they begin to walk somebody through that, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe not to the point where they need to hand it off to a practitioner, but what would it, what should they be keeping in mind and kind of, you know, have their antenna up for? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I think one, probably one of the things definitely, we talked about those physical symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, and I actually have more, um, I, I do have quite a few clients that come see me because they have gone to the ER mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and had the, mm -hmm. you know, heart, heart palpitations and the doctor said, oh, you know, you should um, actually see, you actually have anxiety and you should see um, a clinician. Um, so to be aware of what those physical symptoms are. Um, and also, I think just uh, – so this isn't even a, necessarily about, um, you know, if they have a, a, a congregation member talking to them. I think even opening it up um, mm -hmm. within the church environment itself um, to be more open about anxiety. I mean, there's so many passages mm -hmm. that we can talk about, um, you know, what does that look like, and, and to build an atmosphere in general um, – within a congregation of um, openness, you know, and vulnerability, that this is something that we all deal with. And um, and if you need to, in a sermon, to say, um, you know, what we talked about here today, um, mm -hmm. if we have these symptoms, there's no shame in going to see a counselor right. and having those resources available to them. Um, I think even just having that environment just opens it up, um, mm -hmm. giving them information that they may not get um, otherwise, you know. 
Okay. And maybe even taking another step mm-hmm. as you look at the ethos of your ministry and, and you know, are you causing anxiety? Oh, mm-hmm. interesting. You know? oh, that's <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I yeah, just, yeah. as you were talking, I was uh-huh. like, well, but it also is uh-huh. a matter of, you know, not just if you're opening it up for a conversation, then that opens it up for, you know, a mm-hmm. self-reflection and yeah. saying, am right. I right. am I creating an environment where right. – people are feeling like they have to go beyond themselves or put me and Mm -hmm. us, Mm -hmm. you know, the ministry before their families, you know, Mm -hmm. have I communicated that that is not our expectation? Is that my Mm -hmm. expectation? Is that a God honoring expectation? You know, (laughs) that whole conversation. So maybe Uh that's an additional way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've tiptoed all the way around what it is and what it looks like for a Christian and in ministry in particular, but practically addressing anxiety, (laughs) which Uh if anybody is listening to this, they're probably like, okay, yeah, I get it. I get what it is. I feel it every day. What do I do about it? So um, it doesn't seem like it's something, at least how I've experienced anxiety within myself and in my family, to me, it doesn't strike me as something that you can just kind of like white knuckle your way through. Right. That kind of, it almost seems like that goes the opposite way mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that makes you more and more tense. I don't know. I'm just thinking physiologically. Mm-hmm. So does that make, does it make it worse? How, what does it, what does it yes. do when somebody tries to push through it? Absolutely. It makes it worse. Jenny, why don't we start with you? Oh, so yes. Yeah, so um, one of the things I also incorporate in my practices is, um, neuropsychology. Um, I'm kind of a brain nerd, um, and it's amazing the way that God has made us. But just through um, the way that our brain operates, it absolutely actually makes it worse Mm -hmm. if we're trying to white knuckle it through or trying to problem solve because um, what happens is anxiety happens in the lower half of the brain. Um, Our intelligence problem solving skills happen in the upper half of the brain. Um, And what happens is it's actually a sense of danger, right? So anxiety is when we feel threatened by something, we have this fear, we feel threatened by it, whether it's real or not. Um, And we have a very um, neuropsychological uh, way that we deal with danger, and that is by adrenaline pumping into our body, and our body has this um, you know, reflexive uh, response, and we want to fight or flight. In order to do that, Um, or freeze. (laughs) In order to do that, actually, there's this part of our brain called the amygdala that closes up that pathway from the lower part of the brain to the upper part of the brain. So we can't actually can't access that problem solving, um, that that um, you know intelligence, which is why people feel like they're in brain fog when Mm -hmm. they're in anxiety. So we have to learn how to calm ourselves down. Mm -hmm. And one of the very kind of simplest, most basic ways to calm ourselves down is to breathe, Mm -hmm. um, to take that deep breath, um, and to use our senses, you know, um, to focus in on a sense um, for one minute. You know, I teach my clients 30 seconds to one minute at a time, just focus on a sense. Whether it's sight, you know, look at something around you, or smell, those are the ways that we can lower anxiety, not by white knuckling through or trying to like um, think our way through it or, uh, so we kind of have to start from something that seems very counterintuitive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kelly, what would you add? Um, yeah, I agree totally. It's mm-hmm. it, again fight or flight response. We our brain changes. Uh, we go into a um, kind of a um, survival type mode almost, yeah. you know, and and our executive functioning's not there. Mm-hmm. So we really just need to calm down. We need to. We're at that point. We're calling it's often called flooding uh-huh. uh, that's what john gottman calls it yeah. and so we need to be able to calm ourselves. so to just take a minute and and to breathe deeply and that's something we teach our clients um, other things like something called progressive relaxation so it's a way of relaxing different parts of your body in a, in a mm-hmm. systematic way uh, tightening and relaxing them again and there's a whole kind of process for that um, but there's a lot of good workbooks and things like that out there that people can can look uh, look up and find, or go to a counselor themselves. But um, but when people are really having it, some of this may depend on the the intensity or the the degree of anxiety someone's having, whether this is something they really could or should try to work on on their own, or maybe they really need to think about going to have a counselor kind of step through some of these things with them. I think of it often as um, kind of a um, again, more of a panic time or a time of intense anxiety, acute anxiety symptoms, and us being able to step in and intervene and, and do things like progressive relaxation or, or um, deep breathing, deep breathing, 
Um, but then there's also more preventative things that we can do, just self-care kind of things like mm-hmm. exercise and, and things like yoga and, and mindfulness and these things that really just kind of calm our mind and make us less likely to have develop anxiety mm-hmm. uh, symptoms. So, But there are definitely some things that we can do, and um, it's about in, uh, stepping in but not trying to just white-knuckle it and not trying to deny it or avoid it, like we mentioned earlier, but to just say, hey, I'm, I'm, this is the way I'm feeling, and I, I, it is physiological. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't fight it. And the more I try to fight it, the, more, the worse it's going to get. So, um, yeah. So uh, you talked a little bit about when it is time to actually go see somebody what does that you and you said you know acute anxiety like it you know panic that kind mm-hmm. of thing what else let's talk a little bit more about that what does it look like either for if you are i mean a friend a like family member or pastor ministry leader whoever it is if you're in, interacting with somebody where you think hi you know this is kind of getting out of hand. I mean, I think anytime you think that, obviously Mm -hmm. you typically think maybe you should see somebody. But what are some of the things that you all would say, no, if they're, you know, using very medical language, but Mm -hmm. if they're presenting these symptoms, then they should be, you should really be encouraging them to go see a clinician. What would that look like? For me, the the real kind of litmus test about that is is not just the symptoms, but how, again, the degree of the intensity of them, the frequency of them, and the big thing is, is it causing daily problems? Is it causing dysfunction? Mm-hmm. Is it affecting their daily life? Is it affecting their jobs, their relationships, their their mental health? Mm-hmm. Or is it you know contributing to, to depression or other things? So really, what what is the impact on them? And when it's really to that point of this is really just causing kind of a dysfunction for them for you. It's a it's a kind of a ripple effect. It's a, it's pervasive. It's um, so depending on, there's all kinds of different types of anxiety, but for any type of anxiety, really, that's the that's the, the point to where this might be time to really have someone step in and walk along with you through this. Right. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think one of the symptoms that um, actually um, maybe a lot of people don't know about is actually anger. Um, mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. kids, for children, for teens, it can really it can come out as temper tantrums or it looks like defiance. Um, um, maybe school refusal, not wanting to go to school in the mornings, um, but it can look like this defiance, but it's actually anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, so that can be and for men actually too. Yep, so exactly. it tends to look more like anger for men as well um, right. than you know the panic attacks, um, anger outbursts. So those are times when you know, um, like Dr. Cheatham said, when it starts interfering with their daily lives, they're not able to do the things that they normally do. Um, you know, it's interfering with their work. Um, that would be times when. Mm-hmm. Would it, um, so not only just like straight up anger, mm-hmm. but would that also include like irritability? Yes. You know, like kind yeah. of that low lying, mm-hmm. just like, yes. you, know, like, you know, there's just some people who are like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, you wouldn't call them angry people. And maybe they really love the Lord and do their best not to be angry, but there's mm-hmm. just this like edge mm-hmm. to them. Right. Yeah, yeah. Could, might, could that be. could be. I mean, I, uh-huh. obviously, people could just be people too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, okay. definitely. That um, one of my clients says calls it. Um, I just feel grumpy, you know, mm-hmm. all the time. The grumpiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Interesting. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Okay, so those are um, some things that are a little bit more red flags. Hey, you know, if there are outbursts of anger, or if there are, you know, is a certain level of dysfunction. You know, you're no longer able to do. Mm, life mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. this is actually getting in the way of something mm-hmm. um that kind of says hey you need to go see somebody but if for people who would be below that level you know you talked about getting rest and exercise let's chat a little bit about preventative ways or to, preventative but also mm-hmm. ways to manage the mm-hmm. anxiety that people encounter what are some other things and Kelly already talked a little bit. Jenny, what would you um, add? I would definitely add um, quiet time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and quiet time in nature, like seeing mm-hmm. God's creation. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that kind of adds to you know our information overload. Kind of is also that we're not outside enough. We, we don't. Mm-hmm. We're looking yeah. at what man has made <laughs> versus what God has made. Mm-hmm. So spending time, um, you know, in the Word, um, in nature. That, that sense of gratitude, I think, can help mm-hmm. as well. Um, just being thankful. Um, I think uh, 
one way that I like to look at it that I tell my clients is just like we want to um, work on our, phys- our physical health, you know, by seeing a doctor regularly or um, exercising, eating well, we also need to work on our mental health as well. And there's many things, many ways to do that, you know. Um, and the Bible talks about it, you know, seeing what is good and true, um, like focusing on things that are healthy. Um, and some of the things we already talked about, you know, taking that time to breathe, taking that time to um, do, like, spend time with a friend, um, you know, have connections, connection, healthy connections are super important. Um, you had mentioned, I think you had mentioned about um, being able to talk like being able to talk with our friends about when we're anxious, mm-hmm. being able to do that. Um, having those vulnerable relationships, that's helpful as well. Um, yeah, so it incorporate all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I feel like I'm hearing mm-hmm. slow down. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, <laughs> is that what yeah. I'm hearing? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Or am I just mm-hmm. hearing that through my busy uh-huh. schedule <laughs> ears? <laughs> mm-hmm. But it yeah. seems like, mo- you know, and that, again, like you're talking about, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. if your brain is starting to go, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, like the necessary thing is uh-huh. to just make it kind of slow down right. and mm-hmm. calm down. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to get real real mm-hmm. and maybe be the devil's advocate slash most people's advocate. <laughs> it's really hard to slow down. So how do you do that in the midst of a reality that you might not be able to take an afternoon and go to the art museum mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. like, I mean, right. in reality, mm-hmm. like, it's... How do you guys help people who are like, that sounds really great, and you know what, I would do that in a heartbeat, Mm -hmm. but this is my life. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is that just being problematic, or is it kind of like, no, then you need to change your life, or is it, here's some other Mm -hmm. things, so many other thoughts. Mm -hmm. All of the above. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because, you know, I'm thinking about myself as well. I'm a mom of four. Mm -hmm. Um, My word, four? (laughs) um, And so I'm like, you know, when do I incorporate that? I mean, really, it's discipline. Mm -hmm. Like, the more Mm -hmm. that I... The older that I'm getting, the more I realize that so much is about discipline. You know, you talked about order and Mm -hmm. um, there is a discipline that we need to incorporate in our lives, whether it's, you know, maybe we don't have that full hour. Maybe we incorporate 10 minutes here and there throughout the day. Maybe we incorporate a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it really is about incorporating that discipline into our lives to really spend time with God and um, take care of our our health, Mm -hmm. our mental health, our bodies, our temples. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kelly, did you have anything? Yeah, to I would, add? Again, agree totally. I think there's something to be said for uh, this is where counseling can step in too. If people are really struggling, um, first of all, it would be challenging this idea that they can't change it, mm-hmm. they, they can't help it, or they can't stop it, or do I just have to quit everything? Uh, that kind of, you know, let's talk about that and, and then really get maybe into the deeper beliefs, thoughts mm-hmm. that they may be having about, uh, about why are they pushing themselves, if they're pushing themselves too hard or are really to the brink. What's going on there? What are they trying? What are, what's what are they searching for? What are they looking for? What is what's the meaning of this? That kind of thing. Um, and sometimes it's other things that are that are really there that really need to be addressed and, and brought to the front. That's really kind of driving them to push themselves. So it's um, sometimes it's digging deeper and, mm-hmm. and not just saying, well, okay, then just do this. And we can do that too, but we need to mm-hmm. let's let's talk about this. What's going on here? Because if if we're if you're saying that you are uh, pushing yourself and you can't help it, uh, so to speak. Then what's then why? You know what? What else? What is there there? And then it is. Well, I'm. I just. And sometimes really there isn't a whole lot more. Maybe someone can do. I don't know. But then we're talking about coping with it, and some of those are the self care things we've already mentioned. And to me, that one of the best things is sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's back to the resting. You know, uh, yeah. often. Uh, I just the clients just aren't sleeping enough in there. That's so important. I don't think there's enough. I think there's more now than there used to be. I don't think there's enough awareness about the importance of sleep. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm being totally hypocritical here, but I'm, it's so important. Um, yeah, that's what I'm yeah. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's really easy to say, and it's really hard to do. <laughs> but, it, but it takes discipline. It's true. Yes, that's true. Yeah. You have to be disciplined. You need yeah. to have a, yeah. a plan. You mm-hmm. know, and you maybe accountability. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, don't do things like have a TV in your room or mm-hmm. in your bedroom or uh, look at your iPad two hours before or your phone two hours before. There's all these little things, these rules, and it's 
we know what to do, but uh-huh. doing it, you know, and saying and doing are two different things, right. obviously. And I will add that the act, that's actually where counseling does come in because there are going to be blocks hmm. to that, what we know we should do, right? And that's where counseling mm-hmm. comes in. We kind of dig into that um, and that it's, it's, there's a reason for those blocks. Um, and, uh, I lost my train of thought with that. But, well, okay. uh, maybe uh, uh, uh-huh. one thing is, you know, we often will help, depending on the approach we're using, we are mm-hmm. helping our clients come up with a plan or a strategy mm-hmm. that they're going to take home with them. Mm-hmm. And one of the parts of that is looking at what are maybe some obstacles that you're going to face, knowing your past, so you can use your history to your right. advantage here. What, yeah. what, what's been a problem in the past? And mm-hmm. so we do what we can to minimize those, And but it's a... You're not always going to get it right every day, and, and you're going to have a step back once in a while, but we persevere and keep pushing forward and mm-hmm. and we we don't it doesn't have to be all or nothing or perfect or, or right and we, we just still sometimes it's a trial and error kind of a process and you know, what works for me doesn't work for you and vice versa mm-hmm. yeah. so in general what i'm hearing is slow down take a deep breath <laughs> maybe even pray <laughs> <laughs> you know most likely Definitely. somebody's already done that if you're gonna try to white knuckle which isn't a good idea but if you're gonna try to white knuckle through you should probably do it on a discipline as far as giving yourself an hour here or there you know whether mm-hmm. it's you know mm-hmm. you take one lunch break and mm-hmm. that's kind of your time and you do whatever right. is relaxing to you or you just go out for a walk or you go find a puppy to play with or something mm-hmm. you know uh-huh. but and if you're going to try to you know, like I said, white knuckle, you know, I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek, but it, you do, there is an element of discipline Mm -hmm. that is necessary, Mm -hmm. but it's not in avoiding and trying to push through. It's in, you know, disciplining yourself with margin. It kind of sounds like, you know, something, a place where you can breathe and everything can breathe. And if it gets to a certain point and if it, you know, like we've talked about, Mm -hmm then it's absolutely acceptable to go pursue a clinician and they can help you really walk through and dig in and figure out what's going on. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been a lovely conversation and I hope that um, it was helpful for everybody who was listening and we really appreciate y'all's presence here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the table. If you have a topic you would like for us to consider for a future episode, please email us at the table at dts.edu and be sure to join us next time as we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.